for those of you who were several weeks ago, you saw the first part. This is we're just going to pick up where we were last time uh, before we get started. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. And we're going to start off with uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would help us to understand the scriptures and your power. And we just give you all glory and honor and praise in your name, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so uh, last time we finished up with uh, getting to Judas. All of that was a preface to get to where Judas was. All right? Um, and that's where we're going to. These questions are what we're going to go through. Would you still believe that Jesus is the Christ if Judas had not betrayed him and if Peter had not denied him? Uh, ask yourself, why would Judas betray the Messiah? Um, ask yourself, what, what would it take for you to betray the Messiah? All right. um, what mistake did Peter and Judas make? And then... Why did Satan target Peter and Judas specifically? Right. Who thinks they can answer all four of those questions right now? Okay. So, so uh, I want to correct a couple things I said the last time. Uh, probably the word uh, importance, but Judas is not so much important, but why does he keep getting re-emphasized over and over and over again? Okay. Because uh, there's a lot of things that Jesus says once, and that's it. Okay, so how many times does God have to say something for it to become important? Once. Okay, so if he says it four times, is it four times more important? No. Okay? And early on in my Christianity, uh, uh, Phil Covell and I were in the same church, and I heard that. There's nothing against the church, but, you know, you hear these things. It's like, oh, it must be four times more important. No. Okay? It's equally important. The reason why he says it four times is, when I went to, uh, after medical school, I went to residency and somebody said this, repetition is the hallmark of adult learning. Anybody ever heard that? Okay. Yeah. Why is that? Because if you don't repeat it over and over and over again, that's the thing we're going to forget. So it's not, you know, the, the important things you remember, the things that are, you know, pretty important, but you tend to forget, they repeat that over and over again. So that's why this gets repeated over and over again, because... We will tend to forget. All right. Um, the other thing was uh, somebody. I asked a question. What percentage of the Olivet discourse is new? And somebody said ninety percent. Does the that person here? Okay. Whoever said ninety percent, I said eighty percent. Because I was looking at okay, there's four chapter, four ver chapters that are new, completely new, and then thirteen is kind of. Actually, when you go back and look at it, the reference said 90% was closer, correct? I went back and looked at it, it's like seven verses out of thir uh, 13 that are, if you want to, say new. So 96% of the Olivet Discourse is new compared to the other Gospels, okay? Um, and uh, the point of that is, uh, remember, John has already had Matthew, Mark, and Luke already written. He's not, a lot of times we think of these as, okay, there's the synoptics and John's Gospel. Better way to think of it is there's the synoptics, and then John is building upon it. And John is basically using a lot of new material. It's not basically, he is using new material. Okay? So you got to ask yourself when you see something new that the other ones haven't covered, why is John covering that? All right? So uh, basically, when this board becomes empty, or at 9 30, I will be done. Okay? Um, somebody uh, asked the question. Uh, last time, so what's the x and y axis uh, for this chart, okay, this graph? Is that person still here? Okay, excellent question, all right? After the class, I had several people come up to me and say, oh, I think it should be this, this, and that. Okay, so for any of you that are considering teaching, don't focus on your answers, okay? Focus on the questions you get, because that will lead you where you need to go next. Brilliant question. Okay, because I was like, I'm not, that wasn't my purpose. All right, I'm going to give you an X and Y axis that I propose, okay? If somebody came up after class and said what I said, let me know and I'll give you full credit, okay? Because I, can't, I got bombarded with all the things and I really wasn't paying that much attention, okay? So, um, and 
if you, the reason why I'm focused on it, if you don't understand this, everything else I'm going to say is not going to make any sense. Okay? So um, we started off with uh, this graph, okay? And I said, so what is the x and y axis? So I'm going to turn to John 1 1, because I think John gives you that. First of all, there is no way John sat down and did this graph before he wrote his gospel. Okay? <laughs> so this is just a tool to help us kind of graphically see what's going on. So John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, you know how much I love orange, was the Word and God. Okay? That's what I propose to use as our axes. Okay? And uh, the Word uh, was with God, and the Word was God. <coughs> And then in verse uh, 14, and the Word became flesh. So, um, is Joel here? Okay, so two weeks ago, Joel brought this up, okay? Uh, so I'm plagiarizing from him. You've got to give him full credit for this. The Word became flesh. So this is the living Word. This is the Word of God. If I said... Let's look at the Word of God. Would you immediately start looking around the room to see if Jesus just walked in? No. You open up your Bibles, right? Because this is the written Word of God. Okay? And this is Jesus. Okay? So I'm going to simplify this to living Word of God, okay? And we all know who I'm talking about, right? So that's going to be our X and Y axis. Uh, and this is John 1, 1, okay? 0, so if you know nothing about the Bible and nothing about God, you're at 0. Alright? I know this is very geekish, alright? So, uh, bear with me. Um, in John's Gospel, he's trying to take us to um, believe. Uh, let's look at, uh, before we get there, um, Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? Sorry, I'm walking around a lot. Whoever's got the camera is going to go get uh, dizzy and probably throw up here a second. But, uh, truth. Okay, and then John 17, 17 is uh, thy word is truth, right? So this is truth. Okay. By getting the truth, then you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that's what Bob's been saying. Every, I think every one of his cover slides has belief on it. Is that correct, Bob? Yep. Okay, so since he started this thing, that's where John is going to believe, okay? Uh, so that once you believe, and where he's getting this is from uh, John chapter 20, verse uh, 31, okay? But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name, Okay? That's what the John's Gospel is all about, is getting to that point. He's going to start at 1-1, one, one, and he's going to get up to 20-31, uh, uh, 30, uh, okay? So, if you know, if you study the Word of, so you really want to be this up here, so we've got, uh, well, let's see, uh, what is this axis? This is the Word, what's this axis? This is the Word. So if I plotted this, okay, let's just say I plotted this area under here, okay, that right there. What is the area under the curve? Wow, this guy really is a math geek. Yes, the Army really did send him to study graduate level statistics for X amount of time, okay? What is the area under the curve? Square. Thank you. Exactly. It's a square of what? Did you say it's a square word? 
What? It's the word. This is axis is word. That one's word. The area under the curve is going to be what's area? Square foot, square yards, square meters, whatever it is. Okay? It's going to be square word. Okay? <clears throat> All right. It's also, this is the truth and this is the truth. Okay? So it's also what? Squared truth. All right? So that you may believe and have life. So I'm going to take believe off. No disrespect to Bob, but and I'm going to say that equals life. Okay? Really? You drove all the way in the rain for Mother's Day. Oh, by the way, happy Mother's Day. Okay. Um, you drove all the way in the rain on Mother's Day to listen to, to get W squared equals T squared equals L. Yeah, actually you did. Okay. Because of an oversight on my part. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. I've heard that a lot of women get frustrated on Mother's Day because they teach on Proverbs 31 and they feel so inadequate. Okay. So my goal today is to teach on Judas, so every woman who walks out of here with high self-esteem. Okay? <laughs> All right. Why is that important? You will see this again. So let's say that your knowledge of the Word is over here, but you, you really don't know much about Jesus. Your area of the curve, of the curve is going to be that, right? Or if you know a lot about Jesus, I love Jesus, but I'm not really into studying the Bible that much. Your area of the curve is that. Where do you want to be? You want to be over here as much as possible, right? Have I lost everybody? Okay, you follow me though, right? Okay. So that's that's where we're going with this. So, um, how does this help you to know, believe, remember, Believe, this is, this quadrant is believe. How does that help you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Okay. Let's look at Judas and Peter. All right. So, uh, let me get rid of my orange lines here. How does knowing about Judas help you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Uh, Judas, uh, Jesus prophesies about Judas betraying him. Uh, for those of you that are still awake, go ahead and turn to John chapter 6, verse 64. John chapter 6, verse 64. Oh, by the way, uh, so if, if you ask a question and I do not repeat your question, that's your fault. Okay, for the listening audience at home, if they can't hear, then uh, that was my mistake last time. All right, so John chapter 6, verse 64. Uh, Jesus talking. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Skip over down to uh, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? This is, you know, people start leaving. Lord, to whom shall we go? Uh, you have the words of eternal life. Words, okay? Uh, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Okay? So when you look, chapter 7 goes into uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is, well, by the way, Joel, thank you. I, I plagiarized your written <coughs> word and your written word. Okay? Thank you for that two weeks ago. It made a lot more sense. So, uh, But I did give you credit earlier. So anyway, um, this is before Tabernacles. So this is at least six months before his death that he's telling that he's John is recording that Jesus knows who's going to betray him. So Jesus is prophesying. Now Jesus is prophesying and he gets it wrong. Is he the Messiah? No. Why not? 
because he's God and he knows everything. Exactly, because he's God and he knows everything. Okay? If he's not omniscient, is he God? Well, I'm getting a lot of blank faces. Okay, from. No, absolutely not. Okay? That's going to be important. All right? So uh, let's look at uh, John chapter 13, verse 11. Now remember, this is six months out, and he's predicting this. John's the only one that records that that early, okay? 1311. So there is the, uh, the, uh, at the Last Supper. Uh, for he knew the one who was betraying him. Uh, for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean, okay? So again, before, as he's doing the foot washing, he knows who's going to betray him, okay? Um, John, let's see. So, uh, if ever you teach and you put down your scripture references, put down what the scripture reference is so you don't have to look it up uh, before you say it, okay? But <laughs> well, we're going to be in John 13, uh, 37 to 38. 37. Oh, we're talking about Peter, okay? So, he says, uh, or Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a cock shall not crow until you deny me three times. If he did not deny, if, if he did, Peter did not deny him, was Jesus the Messiah? No, the answer is no, okay? But he is the Messiah because he knew that, all right? So, you know, we go up this, we go up Judas, Peter, okay. So we know that Jesus is able to prophesy, all right? What about Scripture? Uh, right there in John 13, uh, 18. Uh, I do not speak, John thir uh, chapter 13, verse 18. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Okay? Now, what he's quoting there is from Psalm 41, uh, Verse 9, Psalm 41, verse 9. Bob already covered this. Okay. Who wrote Psalm 41? I wasn't there for sure. Who wrote Psalm 41? Who do you think wrote? What's the probability of who wrote Psalm 41? David. David. Okay. And David lived about a thousand years before uh, Jesus. Okay. Oh, I wonder if I can't see on this by Isaiah. All right. It doesn't read as well from Isaiah. Okay, so 41.9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his seal against me. Okay, so 1,000 years before, there's this prophecy. All right. If that prophecy is not fulfilled by Jesus, is Jesus the Messiah? No. Okay. All right, now, we didn't cover this part. When it says, even my close friend, whom I trusted, who ate my bread, what bread is he talking about? You know all the times that Jesus took the loaves and the fishes and made tuna fish salad sandwiches for everybody on picnics? Okay, is that the bread he's talking about? No, he's talking about the bread at the Feast of Passover, the unleavened bread. He's not only talking about unleavened bread at Passover, he is specifically talking about that uh, Last Supper, okay? That Judas is going to eat his bread at that Last Supper, that specific one, okay? Um, does Judas fulfill that prophecy? Yes, okay? Well, what about Peter, okay? What prophecies does Peter fulfill? I'm going to go out on a limb here, okay? Who was... Between Peter, these are your choices, a multiple choice question, okay? Who was Jesus' friend, Peter or Judas? Peter, okay? So Peter, friend. So Bob would understand this. We do friend and foe recognition because you don't want, especially armor guys, the, the, the extra grunts, they're like, oh, it's a tank, shoot it, okay? We want you to know which one to shoot, okay? Because we run around in tanks and we're, the, we're friends. Okay, but friend and foe, Judas, all right, foe, okay. 
at the arrest, when Peter draws his sword, okay, was he faithfully defending uh, Jesus and <coughs> faithfully trying to protect him? Yeah, okay. Anybody disagree? Anybody think he was being unfaithful? Okay, he may not have been doing the right thing. We're not arguing with him, but was he trying to be faithful? Okay. When Judas comes up and kisses him and says, Rabbi, okay, was Judas being honest or deceitful? Deceitful. Okay. So I want you to turn to uh, Proverbs 27. Some of you know where I'm already going with this. Proverbs 27, verse 6. Proverbs 27, verse 6. I would ask one of you to read it, but it won't come across the microphone, so I'm not trying to squeeze you guys. Uh, Proverbs 27, what did I say? 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Okay? Personally, I think that Peter and Judas are fulfilling that thing. Regardless, there's no other scriptures that Jesus is fulfilling. So, on this axis, he's fulfilling prophecy in scripture. On this axis, he's demonstrating that he is omniscient and is fulfilling uh, prophecy. Okay, so that's where you get to this quadrant. And you say, "Ah, it's the truth. I can believe it. I can have life." Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's see where I'm at on time. <laughs> Hey, 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 I mean, you're, it's stimulating me to think as you're doing this, and it just, it occurs to me that, you know, part of what, part of what your argument here is, in John 1.1, 1, 1, when he says, in the beginning, you know, the, the Word was with God, the Word was God, that's something that I could not witness, John could not witness, nobody witnessed that except the Holy Spirit, who told it to John. So, it either maybe it happened or maybe it didn't, but then when the Holy Spirit leads John to specify these things happened in history. Judas did betray, and he was predicted to betray. You know, uh, Peter did uh, deny him, and it was predicted that he would deny him. Now that we can witness, That's right. and so therefore the logic is, what I told you there is true, what I told you there is true also. So one one, one is also true, because I'm a truthful witness. You know, that, that kind of seems like that's kind of the logic there. You know? Yeah, I agree, and for the audience at home, you guys all heard this, but basically what, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, yeah. You know, we the guys that were Peter and Judas and that day of Jesus knew that David had written this at least a thousand years before. They weren't at creation or before creation to see things, but they knew that this thing was at least a thousand years old, and they could have that and say, "Hey, listen, this this wasn't this guy didn't come here and write this scripture, rewrite it, and put out this new uh, translation." Okay, he's fall he's following what we knew well before he was born. Okay, so it's not fixed, yes sir. I want to say there's another dimension to this thing, multiple dimensions, no doubt. Sure. Uh, Judas had to betray because Christ had to be crucified. Peter had to get out of the killing zone. Therefore, he was willing to uh, go after the guys when they arrested Jesus, but he had to clear out because he'd be probably on the cross beside him if he wasn't cleared out. Right. So he had to deny it three times. Maybe that wasn't his intent, but he had to be safe to carry out the, the mission afterwards. That's exactly right. So uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to get to Peter, but the point that so as Jeremy was saying, one of the things is Peter had to deny him so he wouldn't get killed. If Peter had gotten killed, what's the problem with that? You can't build a church on a dead guy. Yeah, yeah you can resurrect him on that. But what is? <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, uh, and Bob will get this, but okay. So uh, at the arrest, Peter grabs his sword. He's a fisherman. Okay, nothing gets fishermen. Probably some of the best infantrymen you can find. Probably wouldn't make a good cavalryman, but infantry, maybe so. All right. He, he takes off the guy's ear, okay? So, okay, the guy's lost his ear, but he's got a sword. What's the guy going to do to Peter? Run him through the heart, okay? Then the Lord's going to have to resurrect Peter, and then Peter's going to take off a little finger, and the next guy's going to run through the heart. And the Lord is like, look, I don't, have to, I don't have time to be here all day resurrecting Peter to go through this hole, okay? So, but... If, if he's, one of the things the Lord says is, hey, that I have not lost any of them. And John, as a matter of fact, let's, let's go to John 17, 12 now. We'll go to it later on anyway. So, uh, John chapter 17, verse 12. 
Okay. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name, which thou hast given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Peter gets killed. What's the problem with Peter getting killed? Didn't he, you just, you know, did not uphold scripture, okay? So, excellent point. And I think this, that's the way you need to be thinking, because I don't, the, you know, before I started studying this, my perception of why Jesus denied him I think it was wrong that Jesus, uh, uh, that why Peter denied him, uh, is like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to die with the Messiah. Personally, in the study, was like, no, I don't think that was Jesus' intent, or Judas' uh, Peter's intent, excuse me. They all get mixed up. You see one, one apostle, you see them all. So, um, the, uh, but I think there's another thing going on, but let's, let's de defer that right now, stay to this, okay? So, um, I'm going to tell you, uh, Psalm. Psalm 41, what did I say, 9? Psalm 41, 9. I won't say, the key verse of John is John 20, 31, in my opinion. Do you agree, Bob? Yeah, that's where he's telling which thesis of his Bible. But the, uh, I could make a compelling argument that the, the climax of the Gospel of John is when Jesus quotes Psalm 41, 9. I'm going to hold that for right now. Everybody say, oh, I disagree. It's the crucifixion. It's the resurrection. It's about anything else except what he quotes Psalm 41.9. Okay? Again, remember, my job is just to make you think. Bob's job is to answer your questions. Okay? <laughs> so just hold on until 9.30. All right. Um, now, did Jesus, therefore, so did Jesus want... Judas at the Last Supper. Yes. Okay. What did Bob teach you before? Did Jesus want Judas gone? Yeah, he did say that. Okay. So who thinks Bob is right? Show your hands. Don't turn the camera back around on these guys. Okay. This is this is a vote of confidence on Bob. Okay. Who think if you think Bob was wrong, raise your hand. You guys are so decisive. Okay. <laughs> Bob was right, okay? He wanted him gone. There's a reason why he wants him gone, okay? But he wants him there. He has to be. If Judas is not at the Last Supper, is Jesus the Messiah? No. Once he's there, does Jesus want him gone later on? Yes, for a specific reason. This, the answer to both those questions, why he wants him there and why he wants him gone, are related to Psalm 41 9. Okay? Alright. Uh, 27, let me see what John. John 13, 19. Um, okay. So, just to follow up on the fulfilling screen. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, uh, occur you may believe that I am He. And then. Uh, John 17, we already read John 17, 12. We haven't lost anyone except the Son of Perdition. Okay, turn, this is in cr critical. Turn to John 10, 35. John chapter 10, 35. John chapter 10, 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. We're not going to talk, Bob already talked about that first part. I'm going to talk about the parentheses part. Uh, and scripture cannot be broken. Okay? That's what this is going to boil down to. All right. For those of you keeping track, that is page one of probably about five, I guess. Okay. Five or six. Uh, okay. So why would Judas betray the Messiah? Was it for the money? Okay? Probably got to oh, erase this. Was it for the money? Did he hate? Jesus? Was it fate? Was it predestination? <clears throat> Predest... Predest... It was corporate predestination. Okay. Next. All right. Uh, was it... The devil made me do it. Okay. Like Flip Wilson would say. For those of you old enough to remember that. Uh... Or was he trying to precipitate a revolt? 
right? I heard that one years ago in my first church. Not that they taught that, I'm just saying that I've heard that one before, okay? Is there anything else anybody has a use burning? It's like, no, I think it was for, yes. For those of us of a certain age who grew up in uh, the 70s, you know, in our teenage years, you know, that's, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar came out, you know, the rock opera. And if it, and it's, its interpretation of Judas, <coughs> to the best of my memory, was that he was sort of uh, on Jesus' side, but he was worried that Jesus would become a revolutionary and then you know the whole thing would come crumbling down. So he basically wanted Jesus to stay philosophical instead of eschatological in a sense. You know, it is, It's kind of making an excuse for Judas, which I don't think is necessarily backed up by the Bible, but it's just an interesting thesis, you know, that he was just, he wanted to avoid trouble, you know, he wanted to avoid getting Jesus into trouble and he was trying to protect him from it. Yeah. You know? So, for the audience listening at home, Bob just, Bob just made a reference to Jesus Christ Superstar in the song he's referring to is Too Much Heaven on Their Minds, okay? Yeah, All right. <laughs> Later on, okay, but hold on. Later on, uh, it, there's a song by Simon the Zealot, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, I can't remember the name of that song. Anybody know? Yeah, I know what you know. Okay, but it had a touch of hate to Rome, okay? Nowhere in there does uh, it record that Simon went around singing this song. Okay, Simon is up. Okay, Matthew, there's very little written about Simon. Zell. But I think you can make a compelling argument. I, I, I can make a compelling argument that at the arrest, that probably was Simon the Zealot's motivation. Okay, all right. But was it? But, but was it Judas's? We're going to focus on Judas right now. Okay. Uh, by the way, which gospel does not mention jo uh, Simon the Zealot by name? Whoa. Okay. John. Do you know why? Because Simon the Zealot owed him five shekels, and John said, I'm going to write you out to the pavement back, but you never paid me back. <laughs> so, but he is, John doesn't mention it, okay? Uh, well, well, that's another story for another day. Uh, let me ask you this question. Why would Judas betray the Messiah? If I asked you that question, why would you betray the Messiah, what would, you, what would your answer be? Low IQ. Low IQ. Low IQ. Okay. Anything else? What? You know, I I I have heard the the the, the revolt explanation, but a little broader than that, which is that 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 Judas was taking a wait and see approach to Jesus because he didn't believe, even though he had all this evidence in front of him, and so Judas was. I mean, we don't we don't have a mirror into his mind, but I think a, an an explanation that suits the the information that we have is Judas. Judas thought the Messiah is going to be a political leader, and so and so by bringing this to a head, either Jesus is going to be crucified. If he's crucified, it'll show the Pharisees was right. Judas is on the right team. If G, if Jesus resists the Pharisees successfully and becomes a political leader, then 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 that'll be great so 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 by by bringing about either one or the other judas is kind of judas is trying it's almost like he's trying to 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 force jesus to reveal himself as the messiah or to be crucified as a fraud and i and i that that at least suits the evidence that i can see so, okay so that's appealing to me all right yes i i don't give judas that much credit i hate to say it but <laughs> the, the love of money, I mean, the love of money is throughout his life. I mean, he was already stealing from the pouch. Um, when you read Proverbs, it talks about what the love of money is going to bring about. Jesus taught more about finances than any other subject, I believe. And so, you know, I think I think it's pretty clear that he had a love for money. And, and, and that was where his sin was. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to follow up on both those. So, uh, first church, then yours, then I'll get to you in a second. Um, so, if Jesus, or if Judas is trying to, Judas is on the fence, he doesn't know, he's either the Messiah or or not, okay? So, if Judas really thinks he's the, uh, potentially the Messiah, that, that would require Judas at least potentially thinking he's the Messiah. So, we're going to look at that and see if Judas really thought he was the Messiah. Uh on the money aspect, I think that the money aspect uh, is 
uh, important to understand Judas's thought process, and I think that that was a, a contributor because it says he was greedy and he was a thief. Okay. Uh, my personal opinion is uh, we're, we're going to get to jump, hold that thought, okay? Because if I don't address it, but I do think the money is important. But you know, how, how much is uh, 30 pieces of silver? What what would 30 pieces of silver get you in that day? I didn't specifically research this. this is what I heard before. What would 30 pieces of silver get you? They, they bought a pretty good piece of land, didn't they? With it, yeah, no, it was at uh, um, Pottersfield. Potter's okay, but what, wasn't that the going rate for a slave in those days? Yeah. Okay, so thirty pieces of silver will get you a slave. Okay, so it's not like okay, I got a slave and I can drink you know iced tea and have somebody wave a fan in the hot you know Judean desert. Okay, <clears throat> so it's not a whole lot of money. Okay, um, but. It, Hold that thought when I get to talk about Judas and why he thought. So your question was? Well, I was going to say, Ty, what you, what you just said about the money, but Jesus said the love, uh, if you cannot love God and money, I mean, you either going to love one or the other. And God, knowing the motivations of our heart, yeah. used that in helping, uh, I mean, knowing what Jesus, I mean, what Judas was motivated by, and it filled, fulfilled scripture. Even the buying the potter's field was uh, sure. fulfilling scripture. Sure. Sure. So that was another element of scripture being fulfilled the prophecy. So God works, you know, it's it's amazing what God can do, you know. Yeah, I agree. Uh, gentlemen, yes. Um I also I was just researching this to make sure. Um in John twelve it John twelve it mentions um, <coughs> uh, Mary after the resurrection of Lazarus, they're having a feast and Mary pours an expensive yes. perfume on yep. Jesus. And, and then Judas is like, why? Why? This is, this is serious, worth a year's wages. And he said it just to back up that he, he, he wants that money. He wanted money, and it says that he was a thief and, all, and, and a smuggler. Anyway, it, it was just clear that he did not want that for the poor. If he wanted that. Yeah, I noticed. Yes, I wanted to research that to make sure, but that was Judas Iscariot. And I think what so the gentleman's bringing up in John chapter 12, in the, the story of Mary pouring the perfume on it, uh, verse 4 to 5, uh, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, again, more prophecy by Jesus, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Okay? Uh, two things on that, I, I think this gentleman is spot on. It goes on to say he wanted the money to steal it. Right, okay, that he was a thief. Okay, now, uh, let me read six. Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but, to, but because he was a thief and he had money, uh, he had the money box and he used to pilfer it, what was put into it. Okay. Um, it's an important point. First of all, the story about the pouring of the oil is mentioned on, uh, of Jesus being anointed, is mentioned in two other gospel accounts. But the other two gospel accounts, it doesn't mention Judas. It mentions that several of the disciples were complaining about this. It doesn't mention Judas by name, okay? John mentions Judas by name. So the question is why? Why does John point this out? There's other things John doesn't mention. The other guys do mention Judas by name. John doesn't, for example, when he's uh, negotiating the betrayal. Secondly, when you go back to Psalm 41, it's interesting that if you look at Psalm 41, verse, uh, we're kind of going down a little bit, I don't know, it may be helpful. Psalm 41, verse 1. How does it start out? How blessed is he who considers the helpless, the Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. Okay? Sounds like, wow, you know, so if you're helping the poor, you know, that's good, okay? And when you read the rest of the psalm, it's talking about how he's going to get betrayed by his friend, okay? The rest of the psalm really doesn't talk about helping the poor. Uh, that may be something that's, you know, again, linking up to Judas. Um, certainly, being greedy and being a thief and being in sin predisposes you to, you know, uh, later on being susceptible to being a target for Satan, okay? And, uh, okay. I'm at 940. Let me, do you want me to keep going or stop? Keep going. Okay, all right. So it's suscept, it makes you susceptible to sin, okay? But uh, Zacchaeus was also greedy. The thief on the cross stole. That did not preclude either one of those two guys. So that in and of itself is not sufficient to say, hey, this is the reason why. I really don't want to focus on this 
Let me go back to the question I asked a moment ago that nobody answered, okay? If I asked you, why would you betray the Messiah, what would your answer be? You would have to not believe he's the Messiah. If I asked you, why would you betray the Messiah, what would your answer be? What would you say? Not hypothetically somebody else. What would you say? I wouldn't betray the Messiah. It wouldn't. Well, let me... Hold on, hold, hold just a second, just a second. I wouldn't purpose. I mean, Peter did. He said hold he on. wouldn't either. What did, what was, let's, let's look, hold on, hold on. I submit to you that if you asked Judas at the time of the arrest, why would you betray the Messiah? You know what his answer would be? As he's standing there about to kiss Jesus, if you asked him, if you could get into DeLorean and go back to 33 AD, okay, <laughs> and ask him, hey, you're about to kiss him. Why would you betray the Messiah? You know what Judas is, what I think Judas' answer is going to be? I would never betray the Messiah. Okay? Now you're going to, as we go through this, there's two people that get focused in this thing. Judas and Peter. If you were at the arrest and you asked Peter, okay, why would you deny the Messiah? What would Peter's definitively, no doubt in your mind, what would Peter's answer be? Never! Okay? Okay? It's the same answer. He would never do that. Okay. I'm not expecting you to, just because I said it loudly like Bob would, and the class three doors down could hear me, that does not make compelling evidence. But in order for the revolt, I'm not going to focus on the revolt. First of all, you, you probably didn't believe in fate. Okay? Because that was, they were Hellenists, and it's a Greek concept, whatever, and they're probably, you know, Philip was had a Hellenist name. Okay? Uh, he sat close to Jesus. I'm not sure he really hated Jesus. I think the money is a, is a factor, okay? Uh, did the devil have a role in this? Yes, okay? In order for the revolt there to be credible, you've got to have some inclination that Jesus, uh, that Judas believes that Jesus is the Messiah. So the question is, who does Judas believe Jesus is, okay? And I, I'm, I'm, we're going to... We are going to look at that, but I want to keep moving on. And yes, you had a question in the back. I, I just wanted to mention that Judas's betrayal was premeditated. Yes. Peter's was not. It was in the moment. There's, yes. There is a difference. And, um, and I, I don't think if you asked Judas before the kiss, you said, if you asked Judas before the kiss, if he was going to deny Jesus, he would say never because he had already premeditated. He had already decided. Yeah, when you look at the, taking the money. when you look at the, the gospel accounts, Jesus brings up uh, Peter's denial in the Last Supper and in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's still discussing this. Okay, so what's the definition of premeditation? If you've been sure, he just got on the spur of the moment, folks. This, but Peter's probably discussing. He's probably all the way from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's like, Lord, I, I'm not going to. No, 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 no. Okay, uh, I think that. Uh, Mm. You know, if you, if you went to court and you said, oh, this is a crime of passion, okay, it wasn't premeditated. For over an hour, I was debating with this person, then I shot them. The courts were, jury may not really go with this, like, well, it really wasn't instantaneous, okay? I'm not, however, the point being, hold on, the, the point that you brought up about premed, Judas premeditated, okay, and uh, what this gentleman brought up, I, uh, I think Peter's denial is not what you guys really think it is. I'm going to put that on the side for a second, but the, I don't see you in the back. Uh, that uh, it's an important point to establish. Judas was definitely premeditated. Okay, and we're going to cover that in a second. Judas was premeditated. That is critical to understand. Gentleman in the back. Yeah, I was just I was thinking about this last week. We talked about this before. You know, when uh, everybody knew. Jesus was before Judas kissed him. I mean, Jesus already said, I need and, and Judas then goes off and kisses him. And I wonder why he, he, he didn't need to do that at that point. Because the whole, I think the whole purpose of the kiss was to identify Jesus. Yeah, what I'm going to do, hold on. I'm going to put us back on track, okay? Because it's kind of like, this is my thesis statement. Now you're asking me a bunch of questions about defending my thesis statement before I've actually gone through my paper. Does that kind of make sense? So let me finish my point, and I think that may answer some, let me rephrase it. It won't answer any questions, but when Bob gets up here and you see the white of his eyes, open fire, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, 
And that's page two. Okay. So what mistake did Judas and Peter make? Okay. So let's define mistake. Uh, go to Matthew 22, 29. That's what we prayed this morning. What mistake did Peter and Judas make? Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. So the Sadducees are confronting Jesus. I won't go through the whole story. But Jesus says to me in 29, You are mistaken. Okay, so this is the definition of mistake. Not understanding the scriptures, not understanding the scriptures, and not under, or the power of God. So you're wrong on this axis, and you're wrong on that axis. Okay? So if you're wrong on this axis, this is negative. Okay? This is negative. You're over here. If you're wrong about Scripture, you're over here. If you're wrong about the power of God, you're over here. Where does that put you? Disbelief. Exactly. If this quadrant's belief, as this gentleman said, this is unbelief. Unbelief. Okay? If this quadrant is truth, what is this quadrant? False square. All right? Uh, and if this quadrant is life, what's this quadrant? Death. Death. Okay? We're not going to talk about ultimately we'll have physical death, but what is eternal death? You're still going to have it, but we're not going to go there. In fact, just so we don't get confused, we'll stay on those two. Okay? So I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. Um, but you understand the concept. This is the opposite quadrant. So what's this quadrant and this quadrant? So let me ask you this. Where do, if you had to plot Judas on here, where would you plot Judas? Which quadrant? Okay. We'll call this quadrant uh, one, quadrant uh, two, since we designed it, quadrant three, and quadrant four. Where would you plot Judas? Two? Okay. What was two? Okay, so I got a vote. That's Judas. Let's put him in a different color. He witnessed all the after he after he after he sold Jesus out. He went back and wanted to get the money back. He said, "This he's not worthy." Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you're going to put him here, okay, you got to give me what was his doctrinal error and what was his wrong belief in God about God. Okay, so if he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, is he trying to precipitate a revolt? Possibly. No, why would he do that? I, I don't know. No. Okay, so I mean, he he wanted him to be king, but not. I mean, he didn't believe he was Messiah. I don't think. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna challenge that right now. But you look through your scripture. You tell me, show me where Judas wants Jesus to become the king. Okay. All right. So, um, anybody else want to put Judas in a different quadrant than this? Okay, I agree with you. I think this is the quadrant Judas should be in. Okay, but you gotta have a reason. You just can't say, "Ooh, I threw a dart and boom, it was right there." What quadrant? Which, yes, sir. I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, uh, Judas was an eyewitness to a lot of miracles. Sure. Uh, why wouldn't he? Why would he deny the power of God? Okay, let's continue on with the paper. Okay, so um, what quadrant would you put Peter in? Because I don't think you can understand. Judas without understanding Peter, and I don't think you'd understand Peter without understanding Judas. What quadrant would you put Peter in? Yeah, somebody raise their hand. One. One, okay. All right. All right. Anybody else want to put Peter in a different quadrant? Okay. I think uh, one is probably right, but you could make a case for four. Yeah. That's case for four, okay. All right, so I got one for one. Uh, and one for four. I'm going to agree with this gentleman, and I'm going to put him in four for right now. But at the end of the class, this would be this is just like the Last Supper. At the end of the Last Supper, everybody got to walk, get up, walk out the door, and do whatever they wanted. Okay, based on their beliefs, you get that same option. But I think you make a case that he belongs here. What quadrant would you put Satan in? Somebody raise their hand. One. You put Satan right here. Which is why he was so against him. So he knew. You can tell the temptation he knew. Sure. I 100% agree with your definition that uh, Satan understood scripture, okay? And I think he probably understood it 
pretty, probably a lot better than, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I already told you, the smart half of the class is on that side, okay? You certainly understand scripture a lot better than I do, okay? You say three. Why do you say three? So, he understands the scripture by, if you understood the power of God, he wouldn't be the devil. Exactly, okay? Uh, I would also put here Satan, okay? Again, at the end of the class, you, when you go home, you can make your own little graph and you can put the little dots wherever you want, okay? But we're gonna make, I'm gonna make an argument that uh, Satan should be there. So let's take a look at what scripture says, okay, so I'm mistaken. All right, let's look at Peter first. So turn to Matthew 16, chapter, Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 15. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. We're talking about Peter now. And then we're going to go back and forth. Uh, Jesus talking. He said to him, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Was Peter correct? Partially. Okay, okay partially. He didn't understand he was the Lamb of God, too. That's what's missing. Okay. Um, all right. I'm not going to disagree with that. Okay. Uh, but... On this axis, okay, um, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm going to tweak it a little bit. But on this axis, we think Peter's up here, right? Okay, let me get rid of this one because it's getting get confusing. Okay, so we think that Peter, green is Peter, we think Peter's up here, okay, on this axis. Where is Peter on this axis on understanding the correct doctrine on the scripture, understanding the scripture, correct doctrine? Okay. So, stay in Matthew 16. Let's look at verse uh, 21. Matthew 16, 21. So right after he says this, and he tells them, Peter, oh, you're great and wonderful, and all this other stuff. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside... Don't you love it? It's like, hey, look, I'm just going to correct your doctrine, Messiah. Okay, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, but you got this one wrong, so let me just correct it so you don't kind of make this you know, bonehead mistake when you go preaching someplace else. Okay, So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, uh, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never... What was the word that Peter was going to use? Okay, Brandon, I'm using an English word, so he probably didn't know never. Okay, never. All right, uh, happened to you. Basically, Peter's saying, over my dead body, okay? But Jesus turned to him and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on the God's interest, but man's, okay? All right, it's pretty strong words, okay? If I called you Satan, them be fighting words down in Texas where I'm from, okay? So, uh, Peter does not want him to do this. Where is Peter on this timeline up above? Where is Peter thinking he is? He's thinking he's right here. We're on the threshold of going into the, the kingdom, the millennial reign. Okay? Peter's eschatology is wrong. Alright? He thinks he's here when in fact he's here. Okay? So this is where Bob and I don't disagree we're going to be, you know, tomato, tomato. Okay? I think his doctrine is wrong, so he's over here. Alright? Which plots him in this quadrant. Okay? Again, when you go home. Alright? Or when Bob gets up here. Uh, let's look at uh, John 18, 10 to 11. John chapter 18, 10 to 11. John chapter 18, 10 to 11. I'm just going to keep repeating until I get there. Because John 18, 10 to 11. Okay. So this is at the arrest. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword drew it and struck the highest priest's slave and cut off his ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. 
Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me shall I not drink. Okay? You would think back in chapter 16, when he said, Get behind thee, get behind me, Satan, that he just corrected Peter's doctrine, Peter got it, and moved on with correct doctrine. John is the only one that mentions Peter by name. The other three uh, synoptics say, you know, uh, uh, an apostle to remain unnamed, okay? John says, it was Peter, okay? Now, Peter's dead. You think that John's thinking, wow, I've lived in this guy's shadow my entire life. He's gone now. Now I'm top dog, apostle, finally, and it was Peter. I didn't do that. No, okay? The reason why he brings up, if he had not mentioned Peter by name there, you would not know which one who did it. You would assume, I, I, I agree with, with, I think Bob's thinking, Simon Zell is probably the other guy. Simon Zell probably said, hey, Peter, i got two swords here. You want one? He said, yeah, okay. Um, he's still holding on to that. Over my dead body, you're not dying, okay? He never got his doctrine corrected. I'm going to move on. Um, let's see. Uh, where is Judas on the chart? Okay. Uh, we talked about in Matthew. Uh, let's go back to it for a second. Uh, Matthew twenty-six. Matthew twenty-six, verse twenty-four. Matthew twenty-six, verse twenty-four. Matthew twenty-six. Verse 24. So we're going to look at 24 and 25. Uh, this is Jesus talking. He's at the, this is in Matthew's account. They're at the Last Supper. The Son of Man is, go, is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He said to him, You have said, so Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. So what does that passage, 24 and 25, what does that tell you about Jesus, uh, Judas? Okay? In the interest of time, okay? First of all, he, he, Judas dismisses Jesus' warning. Okay? Now I'm going to ask you, if you knew you were definitively talking to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and he warned you not to do something, he said, okay, get your hand out of that cookie jar, otherwise it would be better if you'd never been born. Would you still keep going for the cookie? I wouldn't. Is there anybody in this room that would, in the face of Jesus telling you not to do that, standing right there in front of you looking at you, you would continue to go after the cookie in the cookie jar? Okay. Right, here you're old. Uh, is your two-year-old in this class? But no. That's where Judas is. So, but that's what I'm saying. But I want asking you, okay? And Judas wasn't two years old. I'm not, I understand your point, but would you, okay? A reasonable, rational person who understands who Jesus is wouldn't do it. That's what I'm saying. Judas is not thinking this guy's the Messiah, okay? And I probably shouldn't pound my hand right next to the microphone. Another note to self when you teach, okay? <laughs> I, my apologies to those at home. All right. So... Look at verse 49. Uh, so we're still in uh, Matthew 26, verse 49. Um, and immediately uh, Jesus said, Hail, Rabbi, and kiss him. So this is at the arrest. Hail, Rabbi, and uh, kiss him. Okay? Um, so looking at those passages, those in 26 altogether about Judas, when he says, Surely is not I, Rabbi, what is he questioning? What trait of deity is he questioning? Well, because you're looking at his omniscience. Omniscience, yeah. exactly. Okay? Omniscience. Okay? This is key. Uh, I already got black up. Let's go red. Okay? Omniscience. This will be critical to understand. Okay? Um, so if he's if he thinks he's talking to the Messiah, if he really thought he was talking to the Messiah, and he knew he, was omniscient, he wouldn't try that stuff. So he doesn't think he's talking to deity. He doesn't think he's talking to somebody who's omniscient. Okay. What does he call him? Rabbi. Rabbi. What did Peter call him? 
Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, in fairness, when you go through the Gospel accounts, several times other apostles will call him teacher or rabbi, etc. Okay? However, uh, let's go to John uh, 13, 13. John 13, 13. John 13, 13. Just Jesus talking at the Last Supper. You call me teacher and Lord. Okay? The word there is probably master. Some of you have a... Uh, I didn't look this up, but, and Lord, and you are right, for so I am, okay? Does Judas ever refer to him as master or Lord? No, okay? Both at the Last Supper and at the arrest, he refers to him as rabbi. He just, my opinion, <laughs> humble opinion, is that Jesus just saw, uh, Judas just saw him as a teacher like anybody else, okay? And that, um, Let's go on from there because I'm going to go back to that point. Okay, um, in John, we're at John 13, 18. We're at the Last Supper. Jesus says, "I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread and lifted up his heel against me, okay, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, if you were the one guy in the room that knew you were about to betray the Messiah, okay." Would you kind of think that that verse was talking about you? Okay, now, I'm going to pick on Phil, because I picked on Bob enough. After church today, if I took Phil out to, say, Panera, okay, and I bought him whatever he wanted, and he gets a little baguette, right. and I break the baguette, my baguette, and I give him half, and he takes a bite, and then I say to him, Phil, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, that my friend who's eaten my bread has lifted his heel against me. What do you think Phil's going to think about me? He's going to think, I'm, okay, he has a Messiah complex, okay? <laughs> Don't be so sure that Judas is not, he's like, man, this guy's saying that this thing that David, Judas probably understood what he was talking about. He does, he does he's from Scripture, okay? So he knows it's something, you know, when was the last Scripture written? Malachi. How much before Jesus' time was that? 400 years. So if nothing else, Judas at least knows that, I don't know where it is in the Bible, but it's got at least be 400 years old. And you're saying that I'm fulfilling that? Okay? I don't think so. I think you've got a Messiah complex, but I don't think you're the Messiah. Okay? Um, Alright. Bob bought up a point last week. Excellent. He bought up a lot of excellent points. So. Uh, this one relates to what we're talking about right now. The kiss. Who kisses somebody? What's the what's the protocol? What's the etiquette in that day? I did not look this up, so I'm re if Bob is wrong, and your whole theology is messed up because Bob gives you bad information right now. Don't blame me. We're going to blame Bob. But in the etiquette of that day, who kisses the person? The teacher the, kisses student. Teacher kisses student. Do not demonstrate that. I will not demonstrate <laughs> that. Okay. <laughs> Judas kisses Jesus. Everybody in that day would have understood the etiquette, okay? For those of you who are old enough to know the reference to Kung Fu, where he says, you know, wrestle, when you can snatch the pebble from my hand, then you shall become the master, okay? Personally, what I think what Judas is doing, he kisses him. Who identifies him? I think he's correctly identifying him. He's saying, okay, you were the teacher, rabbi, now I'm the teacher, the master, okay? Because uh, you've, let me get to a second. There's some theology that Judas thinks that Jesus has wrong. Peter thinks, okay, is that far-fetched? Peter thinks that Jesus has wrong theology about the cross. Judas, I think, likewise has uh, the wrong impression that Jesus has wrong theology about something. The question is, what's that something? Okay? And I think it's temporarily related to what's going on now. But I think what he's demonstrating is, hey, look, Rabbi, I'm now the teacher. You're the student. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, and you can go all the way to 1015, so don't worry about time. But, they, but this is an interesting point you brought up about Psalm 41. And, and I just make this one little distinction. Psalm 41 is actually not a prophecy. I mean, it, it's not expressed as a prophecy. It's just David whining. 
uh, you know, in his diary kind of thing. But it, but the fact that, that Christ brings it up is because he's saying, he's teaching us, Psalm 41 and, the, and David himself is a type, and I'm the anti-type. He's identifying himself with David by saying that. David was the great king, I'm the great king. David was betrayed by a friend, I'm going to be betrayed by a friend too. It's, but it's not like a prophecy like Isaiah you know, 9 or something like that. It's, it's a type you know, that, that the Lord is identifying for us. Had the, had the Lord not identified that scripture for us, we wouldn't be talking about it because it wouldn't occur to us that that, that was in essence a, a type of what was going to what was going to occur. See what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. I, I'm going to go back to 41 in a second. Okay, and I'm not disagreeing with you because it's a very obscure. I, I agree with Bob. Okay, if Jesus had not said that, then okay, I, I would have never made the connection. Okay, uh, but he does. And, and by the way, it's only in John's Gospel that that quote of 41 is mentioned. The other three guys don't mention it. Okay, so. Is there any indication that Judas is thinking this guy is potentially the Messiah? No. Okay? That's why I don't think he's trying to precipitate. Whether or not he's, I think in his mind he's thinking this guy's not the Messiah. I can precipitate a revolt if I want, but it's going to fall flat. Okay? So I don't think that's what his motive was. That's not the point of this. The point is, where is Judas on there? Does Judas think that, where's Judas' color red? So does Judas think that Jesus, oh good, red. Uh, that Jesus where is Judas on this line? Is Jesus the Messiah, or he thinks he's not the Messiah? No, it's not. No. not. Okay, that's where I think. So the question is now, where is Judas on this axis? Okay. Uh, in Bob's class on uh, 13, somebody asked a question. It was a lady on, young lady on the front row, and said, was Judas's departure from the Last Supper, the Passover, was that kosher? Okay. I told her at the time that was brilliant. Okay, because I think that's the key that unlocks the whole thing. All right, it didn't occur to me what it was. So, was it kosher? Okay. What does Scripture say? So let's look at Numbers nine thirteen. Numbers nine thirteen. Numbers chapter nine, verse thirteen. Numbers chapter 9. That's the problem with picking things in the front of the Bible when you're in the Gospels is you repeat the thing multiple times. Uh, 9, 13. Okay. So he's talking about observance of uh, unleavened bread. Oh, I'm going to start with 11. In the second month on... Uh, and I'm sorry, talk, this is talking about the makeup of Passover. But he's talking about the Passover. Uh, not, what did I say? 9, 13. Uh, but the man who is clean and is not on a journey, so we just before you talk about the exception of the rule, uh, is on a journey, yet neglects to observe the Passover, that person shall then be cut off from his people, for he did not present the offering of the Lord at its appointed time, that man shall bear his sin. Okay? So, if you do not celebrate the Passover, are you kosher? Seems Real, no. Tough crowd. What? Seems no. Seems not. Okay? Uh, how many different times throughout the year can you celebrate the Passover? Once. There is an exception. This verse actually talks about the exception. So when... Uh, it, it, the exception is if you handle it, I'll, let me read it because it, it actually ties in later on. Uh, speak to the sons of Israel. So it's in verse 10. If any one of you or your generations becomes unclean because of a dead person or is on a distant journey, he may, however, observe the Passover to the Lord in the second month on the 14th day at twilight. They shall observe it and shall eat of it uh, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Okay? So that's the one exception. But it's the next month, it's a month later, not one day later, okay? All right, so if Judas is believing that the Last Supper is the Passover, did he, um, I haven't studied this, but you were the subject matter expert before, Was did he, walk, did he stay for the whole thing or did he walk out? I'm not gonna disagree with you, whatever you say. 
Okay. I mean, he showed up for the Passover. He didn't stay for the whole meal, but okay. he, he, he made a showing. <laughs> All right, he made a showing. Yeah. Okay. The, so the, the point is about offering the, the meat was really what the numbers passage is focusing on. If he didn't bring the offering, um, I don't know if that that would be done at the beginning of the meal, not at the end of the meal. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, so debatable. Uh, again, that's not my point. Uh, but it's the, the day of the Passover is the 14th day of the first month at twilight. Um, so Judas is at a fork in the road. Okay, When is everybody else celebrating the Passover? All right. Bob hasn't gotten there yet. In fairness to you and in fairness to Bob, I'm going to defer that question on whether the Passover was the last supper or the next day. Okay? But the question, I, I think the, uh, I think Judas, because the the his buddies, the chief priests and the scribes, are going to be celebrating it the next day. Okay, I see people starting to leave, so we're out of time. Okay, so it'll be right. Let me. That's a good thing. Uh, um, all right. And there may have been a question in his mind: was Hey, is this guy celebrating what? Is, would this have been obvious that this was a Passover seder that he was doing? Yes, okay. Christine, for you at home, Christine's not here. Yes, so we'll take that as affirmative. Okay, so he's looking at somebody who's supposed to be a teacher, a rabbi, and he's doing something that's not really according to the law in potential Judas's mind. Okay? Um, I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, one of the things you got to ask yourself is what's missing? Okay? In Peter and Judas... How many Gospels talk about Peter's calling when the Lord says, hey, I want you to be a fisher of men? How many Gospels mention that? Four. Okay? All four of them. All right? Uh, in the, I won't turn to all of them, but uh, in the interest of time, it's Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5, and John 1. How many Gospels mention where Jesus goes up to Judas and says, hey, I'm going to make you a, you know, uh, a tent maker of men, or whatever his profession was. No. Okay. It gives you the impression, that, yes, in, in the three different gospel accounts where it gives the list, particularly Mark's in Mark 3, uh, 319, where it says that they're on here, he lists them off, and, you know, that Jesus had called these guys to pick the 12. Yeah, he picks them, okay. But you almost get the impression that Judas is a walk-on, okay, that hey, all the crowds are following Jesus, I'm going to do it. Okay? So I'm going to go back to your point because you asked and I said I would fill out stuff. In that day and age, Judas is, he's going to the scribes and chief priests. They're making money off of religion. People, Paul talks about it. To this day, you can make money off of religion. Okay? We're not going to go into all of it, but you can make money off of religion. And that was a, a stock and trade in that day. And I think Peter, or Judas, was following along this guy because, hey, we're making money. People are giving us money and this, that, and the other. We'll walk out the, the money box, okay? I think Judas is the only one that probably picked up on the fact that Jesus kept saying, hey, I'm going to get killed, I'm going to get killed, I'm going to get killed. And he hears all his buddies and the chief priests and scribes saying, hey, we're out to get this guy. You have a question? No, no okay, I'm oh, sorry. The hands up. Okay. Uh, and I think he's thinking, hmm, for 30 pieces of silver, I'm going to ingratiate myself with these guys. It's the price of a slave. They're just going to capture him, put him on a Roman galley someplace, send him off the slave, and you know, row like Ben Hur, do the Ben Hur thing, and uh, we'll be rid of this guy. I'm going to attach myself to one of these rabbis, and I'm going to just make a career move. Okay, and I, I, I personally think that's probably what Judas was really thinking. This is just a career move. Okay, it's not personal. It's just business. All right, and I don't think he was thinking that Judas, that Jesus was going to get crucified. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there. I have to stop there because we're out of time. Okay. Uh, if at some point later on in the future, okay, the next question is going to be why did Satan target Judas? But this is the sort of thing that whatever point that you know you decide that you've had enough and or whatever, I can pick it up. But we don't have to continue here. Any quick questions? We got probably all of ten seconds. Yes, it's ten fifty right now. Any quick questions? Did I feel like anybody asked a question that didn't? Immediately dressed, you can't wait another four weeks or so before I can get another opportunity. The, the only thing I would say is you keep saying 30 pieces of silver is not much money, but a slave, 
probably one percent of the population sure. owned this lake. All right, that's that's pretty small amount. I mean, if if they were the price of a candy bar, everybody would have a slave, and it would be no big deal. I mean, from my research, thirty pieces of silver was a lot of money. Sure. Let's just say it, it was the thing. The question is, where is Judas on here? What I think is Judas had bad theology about uh, the Passover. So between that and that, you get him in this quarter. Okay. Right, and I agree with that. Okay. But but the pieces of silver. Okay, that's the, fine. The other thing you should know about the pieces of silver is, uh, you know, you, you want to compare Zechariah chapter 11. Because Zechariah 11 is a, is a, is a uh, parable that, that predicts what what's going to happen to Christ, and essentially Christ is the shepherd being fired by the flock, fired, you know, the, the, and so the 30 pieces of silver becomes his severance pay. It's Jesus' severance pay in Zechariah chapter 11, and, and that same amount is in, is in essence his severance pay in the gospel as well, because Israel won't have him, and so they, you know, the 30 pieces of silver is transacted, and the crucifixion occurs right after, so, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I, that's all we have for today. Thank you.